PhD. One day you will write books. One day commercials. One day the impossible. You will laugh at the impossible. You will look at the impossible and go, "What was I thinking?" Good afternoon, my spoiler alert friends. Thank you guys for joining me for another episode. Um, so this morning I was reading Esther. It's a book in the Bible for those who don't know. Um, and in particular, I was in chapter four. And in particular for that, um, uh, verses 15 through 17 really stood out to me. Um, so the setting of chapter four in Esther, um, at the beginning of Esther, um, the king of the region, um, he was married to a woman. Um, he told her to come to him. She did not come. So then essentially he said, I'm going to get a new wife <laughs> and that she can't come near me anymore because uh, everyone would then think something negative about their their husbands and that they aren't in authority and all these things, right? So a uh, pretty petty situation, but... That's just a situation that was the times. So um, so he goes and he's looking for a new wife. Um, he has all these uh, virgins from all over the his region come to him. And then he meets with each of them. And then whoever he likes, he ends up uh, crowning as queen in place of the previous queen. So um, he's doing all this. He finds his wife, his new wife, and it's Esther. Uh, she is a Jew, um, and she's like the niece of Mordecai, who is a Benjaminite. So, um, and the reason that's important is just because uh, her parents had passed away and Mordecai took over um, caring for her like she was his own. So, so that's that's the setting. You have Esther. That's why this, this book is about her. And really, I guess the book is about her because of her, her faith and what she did for, for the Jews of the time. But um, going into chapter four, you have this guy named Haman who just did not like the Jews. He didn't like them. Um, he had whatever whatever his reasons to be um, against them were, it was, you know, just how, again, how it commonly was back then. And shoot, even how today people don't like races for whatever reasons. Right. So, um, this guy, Haman doesn't like the Jews. Um, and then there's Mordecai and Mordecai is important because he, um, he basically foiled a plot to kill the King and the King, um, liked him and all these things. Right. So, uh, Haman, there's a, there's an edict from the king that says, you know, on this day, everyone's going to worship me and bow down and all these things. And Mordecai said, did not do that. So he's like, you know, essentially similar to, to Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and all of them, you know, when they're like, nah, I'm good on that. <laughs> you know, that doesn't, that doesn't fit in with my faith. So uh, Haman sees that Mordecai is not doing, following this edict and worshiping. So he's like, man, I really can't stand these dudes. I'm going to get, I'm going to try and get them, um, killed. So he presents the story to the king in a way that made the king like, you know what? You're right. We need to get rid of this threat, um, to the kingdom. Cause essentially he was saying, if you don't do something about this, then, um, People aren't going to be following you and it's going to be bad for the kingdom. And plus, I'm going to give you money if you go ahead and do what I want you to do. So the king says, sure, go ahead. Do with these people what you think is best. So Haman's like, I right, bet we don't have to get rid of all these people. So he uh, he puts out a, a decree that all of the Jews, men, women, children, old, young, everyone, all Jews will be killed on one day. Um. Now, at this time, and I guess you will find out later after chapter four, but the king did not know that his wife was a Jew. He he got to the point where he loved her a lot and he was like, you know, he that was that was his lady. He did not know she was a Jew. And so that's the underpinning that you're going to go into after chapter four. But the the thing that I the reason why chapter four kind of stood out to me was because um, so Mordecai, so this, this, this decree goes out to the land and everybody, everybody hears about it. 
And um, Mordecai comes to Esther like, yo, you see what your man is about to do? He's about to have us all killed. And that's not just going to impact us. It's going to impact you too, because don't forget, you're a Jew. And she's like, oh, wow, this is actually, this is a big deal. So um, Mordecai's like, hey, go to the king, talk to him, try and get him to change his mind, fix this situation. And um, Esther says, okay, what I need you guys to do, I need you guys to fast. So no no food or drink for three days. I'm, she was going to do the same thing. And then she was going to present herself to the king and discuss this situation. Um, but the thing that was like, wow, just super, there were two pieces to that that I thought were really powerful, right? So one, she asked for this from the people and everyone complied. Everyone did what she asked. And for people who fast and people who don't even fast, um, you know that even like a 16 hour fast can be challenging. Um, so, and that's when you're still able to drink water or some people allow themselves to drink coffee or something like that. But um, that's when you're still able to drink something, but you just can't eat. And that's 16 hours. This was three whole days of no food, no water. Um, and being in medicine, I've seen, I've seen people who are literally knocking on death's door, discharge themselves from the hospital because they couldn't eat, because they had to um, be NPO, which is nothing by mouth, overnight so that they could have a surgery in the morning and didn't have an adverse event during surgery. People will literally leave knowing that they could die when they leave just because they couldn't eat. So people and their food, that's a very strong driver of behavior. And for everyone, all of the Jews to comply with no food, no drink for three days was just that's incredible to me. That's a miracle in and of itself that they were even willing to do that. And um, the second thing that I noted was that even though it didn't exactly match, um, the intensity in the situation matched the intensity of the worship. So um, like I said, it didn't exactly match because three days of fasting is not the same as the same intensity as everyone dying. I get that. But it kind of illustrated that for me where it was like, okay, here we are. We have something that's really big, really important. So this very big, very important thing, we're going to try and match that intensity with our worship and um, pray that God delivers. Right. And I just thought, you know, that's an interesting idea. I know it's not necessary to do that, but I think it's a cool practice to maybe try and implement at times is to when you have something that you want deeply, that is very valuable to you. Um, your worship might go a little further if you if you match the intensity for your desire in your heart with the way you ask and praise God for it, right? So I just thought it would be fun to share that with you guys. Um, that was my what my take on it, what I gathered from it. Um, I recommend that everybody that you guys read the whole book of um, Esther. It's a really cool story. Um, one of the women of the Bible, you know, uh, cool things that way. But um. Hope you guys can marinate on this, um, think on it, maybe apply some things. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts, what things you gathered from the story, what things you um, might want to implement in your own lives. If you don't want to share, that's fine. But I just like the conversation. So um, thank you guys for joining me and I'll see you guys next time. One thing I know is that I'm going up. It's the